Hello, listeners. Been wondering how you can help the show? Probably not. But here are five things you can do. One, subscribe. Support the show by clicking the subscription link in the show notes. Two, review on iTunes, on our website, www.afraidofnothingpodcast.com, or on whatever app you listen to. Three, donate. When you go to our website, click the cute coffee cup icon. Or in the show notes, click the subscription link. Four, share. Sharing really is caring. Tell your friends and even your enemies to check out the show. Five, watch. Wait a minute. It's a podcast, not a movie. Actually, it's both. Check the show notes to find out where to watch the documentary. You can also rent it on Prime Video. That's it. Oh, one last thing. Enjoy this episode. Hello, everyone. We've got another great show tonight. But first, I'd like to start off by thanking some great reviews from some listeners. First is from Cindy Dwyer in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Cindy gave me a five-star review and wrote, Absolutely captivating. I love this podcast. I have learned something from every podcast. I love Robert Heskey's easy and entertaining style, as well as the great guests he interviews. I look forward to many, many more podcasts. Cindy's husband, Robert Dwyer, also a listener in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, shared another great five-star review. Divine Intervention, Robert wrote. Excellent podcast. Great content. Professional presentation. Wait for and enjoy every episode. A funny story. I learned about your podcast while shopping at Bernie and Phil's Furniture Store. There was a large man in front of me in line talking to the clerk about a paranormal podcast he had. I searched for it, and Cindy and I have enjoyed every episode since. I did, however, wonder what this large man was doing in my furniture store. Who is this large man? Thank you for what you do. Well done. Rob Dwyer from Shrewsbury. And then another person from Shrewsbury, believe it or not. My daughter, Emily Heskey, actually went on and left a review. So I'm going to give her a little shout out here. Emily wrote, fantastic podcast. The Afraid of Nothing podcast is fantabulous. I love it so much that I know that my dad is hosting this podcast. I love it. And I love you, Emily. Thank you for the five-star review. And while I'm giving thanks, I also want to thank Danny Perez, a.k.a. Danny Radical. You might remember Danny and his wife Lauren from our 11th episode, Afraid of Cursed Objects. Danny recently bequeathed me with a custom Afraid of Nothing Ouija board. Awesome work, Danny. Thank you. To check out Danny's Museum of Wonders and Oddities, custom Ouija blood boards, radical Red Devil barbecue sauces, and blended peanut butters, and other guilty pleasures, visit www.dannyradical.com. That's www.dannyradical.com. And now, on to tonight's episode. I know it's a podcast and you can't see him, but tonight's guest is someone you've definitely seen before on television. His name is Gene Silvers. He's not only an actor, he's a magician, a photographer, and Gene had a pretty crazy year in 2020 and also shares a very unique kind of unsettling paranormal experience. And Gene has even more to say, so tonight is just part one. Settle in, grab a shot of rye or whiskey or whatever you drink, and enjoy. In a world where nothing is known, nothing is certain, reality is not real. Wake up! Be afraid of nothing. I'm Bob Heskey. Robert. The host with the ghost. This is my podcast, based on my paranormal documentary, Afraid of Nothing. Each episode, we talk to people who see life and the afterlife through a different lens. Join me. Who is this large man? And what's he doing in our bedroom? As we lift the veil and open our minds to see beyond our eyes lie. This is Afraid of Nothing. 
Hello, hello. I am here today with not one, but two actors. So, warning to our listeners. It could get pretty dramatic. So, first actor, actor number one, Kyle Carvin. Kyle, my sometimes co-host, how are you doing? Hey, hey, hey. Good to be back. Thanks for having me back, Bob. You were traveling around the country a little bit. Want to give us a quick update on kind of where you went? And are you back home in Atlanta now? I am back home in Atlanta. I think it was like... Uh, maybe it was like a midlife crisis type of thing. If I'm that old, I don't know. But yeah, I was on the road for like uh, two straight months. I went all over about 10,000 miles. I lived in my truck. Awesome experience. And I definitely want to make it like at least a, a biannual thing. It was awesome to see the nation on my own time. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's probably good you went by yourself. We all have heard in the news like when you, what happens when you travel in a van, sometimes domestic stuff. So it's good you're kind of by yourself doing it. So, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> welcome right. back. And actor number two is a, a friend of mine, a buddy, Gene Silvers, who uh, was in my first movie, Blessed. I, had, I fell in love with Gene's demo. He's just an awesome actor. He did a great job in my film. And, and this past year, I mean, Gene really blew up. He had some great parts. Gene, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Bob. Good to hear your voice again. Yeah, you too, man. You know, 2020 was tough for everybody, but you had a a really kind of yin-yang type of year. You had an accident that you almost died from and and put you out of commission for a little bit. And you also landed probably uh, two of your, might be two of your best roles. I know you have a lot of other great roles. First one was Them on Amazon Prime, and the second one is The Mosquito Coast on Apple Plus. So, hey, congrats. Thanks, Bob. Yes, it was a good year in those terms. Uh, But as you said earlier, the yin and the yang, there is also some terrible stuff going on. The ski accident and just very, very late in 2019, my father passed away, which kind of was a lead up into a, a lot of this. Yeah, condolences for losing your dad. Real sorry, sorry about that, Gene. And I know, you know, on top of that, that skiing accident, what people may not know is you're a really good athlete. You are a very high quality skier. You do surfing. You're a magician. So you have you're very good hand eye coordination. But you were on a uh, kind of challenging ski slope and something scary happened. You want to fill us in on that? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me just give you a quick, quick lead up into that. So, um, it was a, a very bad year. Uh, my dad was extremely sick, and then and then it, he had finally passed away. And uh, I was just I, I had had gone through such a dark year. Kind of the way that uh, I like to escape. Sort of my my passion is uh, is skiing. And so a couple of months after he passed, uh, I was um, finally got got a chance to get on the mountain. I was on Mammoth Mountain, California, which is probably the the uh, the tallest ski mountain in uh, California. I had been on green blue runs with some friends most of the day and I was just itching to kind of do the the harder stuff and there was a double black at the very top and it was icy and there was nobody else on it. So there were pretty much all these these signs that I should not have have done it. Uh so it was a lot of stupidity on my part. I also just had my skis sharpened. Basically, uh, I, I got off the lift and I got to this uh, this chute that was pretty steep. I did one or two turns. One of my skis held in the in the ice and popped off my foot. Uh, and then I was on my stomach, starting to shoot down on my stomach. The other the other uh, ski popped off. And uh, have you have you ever seen like a luge? How the guys are on their stomachs and they're shooting around the track? Yeah, that that, that was pretty much yes. me uh, on a very very steep icy chute, shooting face down, uh. pretty much like in a Superman pose, but uh, pretty much far from Superman. I was pushing down as hard as I could with my hands to try to stop myself. I must have been doing somewhere between like twenty and thirty miles an hour. I believe one of my my left hand hit a rock at a super high velocity so hard that when my hand hit the rock, my feet flipped over my head. And then I started to go into what I guess you'd call a, a tomahawk spin. Have you ever seen those cartoons where you see the tomahawk flipping over and over and over again? Yeah. That pretty much was me. Wow. 
I was flipping so fast. The fear, I can't even begin to express how terrifying it was. There, oh, I forgot to mention, as I was flying face down on my stomach, I was headed towards a gigantic rock wall. Wow. So I thought that literally I thought I was going to die. I thought I'm going to hit this wall and it's going to be over. It was just abject terror. And that's when I my hand hit the rock and I went into this flip and uh, I basically blacked out. And then I came to, uh, I guess, a minute or two later and I had fallen, spun, flipped about 400 feet down the mountain. And when I came to, my left hand was blown up like a watermelon and I could see my left thumb was like twisted into like this uh, impossible position. And, and then after I realized, I, I hope I didn't completely wreck my hand, I thought, okay, at least I'm alive. And then my next thought was, I think I just might have lost the part that I was about to shoot two weeks from then. Uh, yeah. and, uh, is, so, you, you know, breaking your hand probably saved your life, though, right? Because you were heading toward that wall, and then you just it probably shifted your, pivoted where you were going and got you away from that. You know, I I. Th- I would imagine so. I would imagine so. But basically, once the patrollers came and got me and put me on one of those sh- those sleds, they, yeah. they told me that I was extremely lucky to be alive. It sounds like the opening of one of those really bad James Bond films where he's like doing this death-defying thing and he survives. You know, and the only yeah. thing would you wake up in a hospital with like this kind of buxom German nurse or something? I don't know. But so yeah, did you? Okay. So how did you like recover? And you just recovered? And how long did it take you to be able to? You were you able to walk away? You you weren't you were, you were able? No, to- I mean I, I I could walk. I did also tear my LCL and ACL, but I managed to walk once they brought me down and went to the hospital and had X rays and saw that my thumb was completely smashed, like shattered. Then my my wife basically drove me home in, in, in a blizzard a couple hours later. Of course, right? And I went into surgery like two days later. And I had a seven pins put completely through my hand and have had three surgeries since then. And my thumb is still kind of misshapen. And I'm having a fourth surgery on my hand in about uh, another six months. And you, and you have a surgery so, uh, tomorrow. Is that related to this too? or It could be. Both my knees kind of got screwed up from this accident. I think just my whole body got pretty... Uh, pretty damaged. So uh, th- this surgery on my knee is somewhat related. My meniscus is all torn up and everything, but I still ski. Uh, this uh, good thing, uh, this is whole, nice. I've been cringing this whole time. <laughs> it sounds so, it sounds so horrible. <laughs> I have to give away a little bit of a magic secret here. It's now become impossible for me to palm a coin in my left hand. Um, yeah. Because we'll yeah we'll we'll have to definitely get to that because Gene is also a magician yeah so a little less magic now in some ways but not necessarily skipping ahead but I definitely think you know that uh, that little event of of like Bob mentioned of your hand hitting a a rock or whatever caused you to stop when you did or alter your trajectory you know I think all things happen for a reason and you know there's a saving grace there despite. Uh, how oh, yeah. horrible it still was, yeah. I believe, I mean, the patrollers said it's really a miracle that I didn't hit. It wasn't just ro- one rock wall. If this, if this, For those of the audience out there that knows Mammoth, it was Chair 23 on an area called Wipeout Shoots, which I did indeed. And there's these huge rock outcroppings all around. So just the fact that I managed to get through that without slamming against a rock wall and also the spin that I was doing as I was flipping, I don't know how I didn't break my back or my neck or mm. they said it's a miracle that I didn't escape with much, much worse injury. Someone, someone who's in the hospital that was never going to walk again, that was basically did a similar fall to me that had happened like a month or two earlier. Yeah, that's, um, that stuff's so scary. It's, it's funny to hear your, uh, one of your thoughts right away is like oh my, you know i have this great i have this great acting gig am i going to am i going to miss out on this because of this uh, so it's a funny thing to think of yeah because i had actually booked the apple plus tv show 
like a few weeks before this ski accident. And I had never gotten into a ski accident in all the years I've been skiing. So I, I, I didn't, didn't think I was going to get into one. And, you know, one of the first thoughts I had after I realized I was alive was like, oh, crap, I uh, think I just uh, lost my uh, big acting gig. <laughs> I don't know if anybody got that on camera. It sounds like from an outsider's perspective that maybe one day you'll get to look back on it and hopefully laugh or somebody is. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know man. if that's I horrible to say or not. I can't even think about it right now. When I literally think about it, that sensation of flipping so fast, it was like a strobe light, like sky ground. Sky. Mm -hmm. it, the flip was so fast that when I think about it, I, I start to go into a panic. So, oh yeah, you probably have a little PTSD. I I did a um uh, back in 2012. It sound like sounds like our experiences are similar. I, I got into a motorcycle accident out in Burbank, yeah. and uh, same kind of thing. Like when I think about the event that happened leading up to it, like it still affects me now. So I'm sure you're going to be living with that for for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the upside is we're actors, and I guess you know if you ever need to be terrified, you can always. <laughs> about that moment and use it as an emotional preparation right so. yeah well that gene now kyle dr drives in a big truck he doesn't have a motorcycle <laughs> yeah, I got so far away from the motorcycle yeah i'm not i'm not brave like gene i i'm not i'm not gonna i'm not gonna ski stuff. yeah <laughs> no, no, i love the, i love this sport too much to give it up so i you know i already got my icon pass and i'm planning on hitting the snow this year nice so yeah yeah we already you know we'd already touched upon it so you were supposed to shoot Mosquito Coast coming up, and now you are. I'm guessing you're wearing a cast. Did you like call? How did that work? Did you call your agent and tell them, or, oh. or how'd that work out? Yeah. Okay. So this this is kind of interesting. So I didn't know what to say to my agent. I thought if I tell my agent that I went skiing and almost killed myself, and I have a cast. I think he's going to be pretty pissed at me. It's as as would production. So it's going to get out if uh, if if he ever hears this podcast. But um, basically, I lied. Um, I told them that I was in a car accident Ooh. and that I broke my hand in a car accident. I didn't I didn't want him to think that I was th totally irresponsible. <laughs> which uh, I, I guess you've I been on another podcast, so Gene. I've heard this story, so that's okay. I think you'll you you would have been outed by now. I, I heard you on a couple yeah. other really cool. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, that's what I told them. He wanted to wait to see what the doctor said and what what had to be done to my hand if there could if I could didn't have to wear a cast. But ultimately, this the surgeon said, "No, you're you're going to be in a cast for a while." So I I said to him, "Yeah, you're going to have to call production, let them know I was I was in this accident. I'm having a cast, and I still very very much want to do the part, but can I do it with a cast?" And he got back to me after speaking to production, who cleared it with the director, who happens to be a director. His name is Rupert Wyatt. He directed a couple of the um, Rise of the Plant Planet of the Apes movies. So he's a pretty big director. They came back to my agent and said, well, okay, the I was the sheriff of Yuma, Arizona. So they said the sheriff uh, can have a cast. It could just be one of those quirky things, you know, like, I don't know, sheriffs are man of action. <laughs> yeah, that works. I mean, it totally works. And I actually watched the episode today and I did not notice your cast. Maybe I'm that oblivious, but yeah. Oh, well, I guess, I guess a lot of the, a lot of it was a uh, close ups on me and the sleeve kind of comes over my hand, but yeah, he even asked me at one point to wave my hand around and make a thing of it. <laughs> and, and, and they had uh, the rest of the crew sign it. So I, it had a little character on it. No, that's fun. So, and, and no explanation. It's just, you know, one of those quirky things. Guy has a cast. Well, that's perfect. That that's I think that's so cool that it worked out that way. And uh, sidetrack, it reminds me of an article I read with Stephen King uh, many, many years ago, at least 10 years ago. He used to do a column in Entertainment Weekly. I'm not sure if he still does, but he he's right his article was just about that kind that kind of detail in our entertainment when he said He's like, why does everything have to have a backstory? Why do we need to explain everything? Why can't things just exist just because? And he's talking about horror and criminals and whatnot. But it's the same kind of thing. I love when there doesn't have to be an explanation for everything. Well, there's quirkiness in life. I think the first time I saw something like that was in Fargo. 
I, I don't remember exactly where, but there were all these little quirks that weren't explained and you just sort of realize these are real people and they're, they've got idiosyncrasies and that's it. It's not really important to the story, but they, it adds a level of detail that just makes it interesting. Absolutely. There's another interesting story around that uh, experience. I don't know if you noticed in the beginning, uh, the, the helicopter lands and I greet the two um, FBI agents and I say, hi, I'm, I'm Sheriff Gene Sil. I'm, I'm Gene Silvers. Oh, I totally heard that. Yeah, that's so funny. I was going to ask you that. I was like, did you say your name? Because that's so funny. <laughs> this is one of the few times you will see a character with the exact same name as the actor. And uh, what happened was uh, the helicopter landed, the two FBI agents got off, and the director said, yeah, I want you to greet them, give them some kind of a greeting. So... You know, usually when you greet someone, you you say your name and, you know, I'm the sheriff and and so and so. So I just said my name. Hi, I'm uh, Gene Silver, Sheriff of Yuma. Welcome to uh, wherever. And I don't know, I just, I didn't realize they were going to keep it in the show. (laughs) And, you know, this was on the spot. I wasn't about to make up a a name. So I just said my name and thought they'll blur it somehow or won't won't use it. But they ended up using it. So there it is. Yeah, that's so cool. You got to play yourself, and there's a whole part designed right after right after you. Yeah, How that's cool is that? Well, yeah, that's right. yeah. So uh, you know, just just to give you a little background on the show, uh, Mosquito Coast is uh, it's based on the the book by Paul Thoreau and it, the movie of the same name with Harrison Ford, and it's starring uh, Justin Thoreau. He's this uh, idealist that uh, raises his family in, in a very purist, anti consumerist way. And uh, somehow ends up getting in trouble with the FBI and is trying to escape America to this uh, utopian group in Mexico. He basically, through his wit, gets into Mexico. He's very, very smart, sort of like a MacGyver. And uh, once he, he travels into Mexico, the FBI comes to the town from where he escaped and I'm the sheriff of Yuma that they make contact with. And we have a, a couple of scenes where I sort of get the record straight on, on what happened and set up something about the border and the way things operate. There's a little bit of politics involved there, but that's basically the, the idea. I have to watch more of that because it sounds pretty cool. And then this other show you worked on, which is called Them on Amazon Prime, so why don't you just tell us like a little bit about the show? I watched your episode today and it's it's like Bob mentioned, it's really, uh, it's pretty intense. So why don't you fill us in on the show and uh, and your involvement in it? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, there's so, <laughs> there's so much to say about this show. When I first got it, uh, it was actually a director I had, I had worked with before in New York had thought of me for this particular role. And I didn't know anything about the show. Uh, he sent me the script, and I saw the things that I had to do as this character. And they were pretty bad, to say the least. Uh, just to give you some background on the show, first, what was the number one show on Amazon Prime for a couple of months, and it was pretty controversial. It starts out that there's um, a suburb in uh, California. It's Compton. And Compton back in the day was a, was an all white uh, suburb white picket fences and neatly trimmed lawns and and all that now it's it's a very different place but back then uh, that's what it was like and this black couple to escape the racism of the south comes to move to uh, to this area and at first they're welcomed by these middle class supposedly nice people they're welcome there but things start to deteriorate and get more and more horrific first psychological torture and then just uh very very bad stuff goes on and it, it enters sort of a supernatural element bob which i think you'd really enjoy there is this one main villain who's very mysterious. And in episode nine, there is an origin story of this character played by an actor named Christopher Heyerdahl. You, you've probably seen him in a million movies. He was in Twilight and Hell on Wheels and a, a bunch of stuff. And that's the episode that I'm in. 
the, the Compton ones almost seem like the 1950s or 1960s, right? What's the time frame for the main set of the uh, of the series? Because your your episode is like another lifetime, like in the you know Amish days or whatever the 1800s right. or something. Correct? That's that's correct. Yes. Yeah, so so the first eight episodes are all in Compton and like the the it could be the late 50s, early 60s. And my episode takes place in the 1860s, right after the Civil War. And there's no explanation to it. All of a sudden, you're watching this show that's taking place for eight episodes in in the 1950s. And all of a sudden, it's all black and white. And you're on this pioneer village in the desert, this bizarre Dutch religious community uh, that's very hard scrabble and barely getting by. That's when my episode takes place. Yeah, as you mentioned, there's a, there's some, you know, especially in the in the current political climate, or I guess it's not even current, but with a lot of the the racial issues, your episode dealt a lot with that. So why don't you you dive into like your character and and, and your personal experience a, a little bit more of doing the show? Oh, I, absolutely. So in my episode, I had already explained that that this this black couple uh, in the in the previous episodes had moved to Compton and slowly they started to become tormented. So in my episode, there's another African American couple on their way to a religious community. Their, their, their wagon breaks down and they get taken into my community, sort of a parallel of what happened later on, but uh, like a hundred years earlier. Uh, and they get taken into this religious community and at first, things seem really copacetic, and gradually things start to get worse and worse and worse. My character, Elder Luther, is one of the, if not the main provocateur to sort of turn the community against them. At first, it's sort of subtle, and then the things that I have to do get pretty horrific. So when I read the script and and saw what I had to do, I I don't know how much detail I should reveal, but uh, you you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah. I thought that if I ended up doing, I mean, it's about the worst stuff I think I've seen on a TV show, and it's two African Americans. So I felt that if someone saw what I did and the lines blurred between the actor and the character, you know, I may, may start getting, uh, getting stalkers, you know, I may start getting hate mail. It may, uh, end badly for me. So I, uh, I thought about not, not taking the part for a while, especially in the light of this was right in the, the middle of black lives matter and, um, and all of that. So, uh, I wasn't sure if this was a good move for me. Yeah, that, and, uh, I guess it could have gone the other way too. Not not just um, hate mail, but you could get uh, love letters from some certain people that you or certain groups that you you know in support oh, of your, yeah. your your character. You know, because some some folks out there have a tough time differentiating characters from the actual actors. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I I think ninety nine percent of the people are going to realize, oh, this is entertainment, and somebody has to play the bad guy. Yeah. You know, just like Ray Fiennes had to play a Nazi in Schindler's List, and he got an Oscar for it. But there's, there's always, there only takes one or two, you know, people yeah. out there that, that blur the lines to make life difficult for me. So, um, I thought about not doing it and I discussed it with my agent, my friends, and they said, look, this is a huge opportunity for you. And, and people will realize this is entertainment and you're not that guy clearly. And, uh, you'd be a fool not to do it. So I ended up doing it. And gee, just to add, like. So the first eight episodes, I've seen a couple of them, but I, I'm imagining the first eight episodes have kind of a build to the supernatural stuff, where this episode that you're in, it like takes almost those eight episodes in a different time period and crunches it together in this crazy type of, they arrive, everybody seems friendly, uh-oh, things are turning, and then all hell breaks loose. So there's really a lot that happened in your episode in one tight time period. Yes, yes. I mean, the the, the basic idea was that one of the, the main villain, uh, Epps, again, uh, the character was played by uh, Christopher Heyerdahl. He exists as this villain in the previous episodes. And in this episode, you see how he came into being. He's actually um, like 
I don't want to say an immortal, but he's at least a couple of hundred years old. So in my episode, you see how he came into being. He kind of made a pact with the devil in a way. You you find that out later on. But that's that's the reason for this episode, which which is very interesting. It, it kind of hurt me in, in a way, though, in, a, in, a, in its interesting way. I, I uh, at first had probably the second lead in the episode, but uh, my part got cut down a lot because they wanted to focus a lot on Epps, which I totally understand. But um, <laughs> what, what you see of me is about half of, uh, half of what my part actually was. Yeah, it was still pretty substantial, though, right? Do you think, Kyle? Or- yeah, yeah, it was a great role, and I think uh, Gene, you did a great job. I didn't know Bob very well during his. I didn't. I didn't know you at all, actually, when you when you did your feature, and I watched it years ago when we first met. And so I've seen Gene. I've seen you in that uh, in in uh, Blessed, and I've seen you now in Them and Mosquito Coast, and you're fantastic. So um, yeah, you did a great job. You always do. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it was. It was actually. I mean, despite all the crazy stuff I had had to do, which again, I. I, I, I'm hesitant to reveal. I don't want to put too much of a spoiler into it. It was still a really a- amazing time. I, I got a chance to live in Santa Fe for five weeks. We shot it during COVID. We were we were one of the first shows to start shooting again. So we had to be tested twice a day. Someone on set did come down with COVID. Set was shut down a couple of times till they were clear. So I got a chance to really explore uh, New Mexico, hiking in the local mountains and hanging out in this beautiful town of Santa Fe. And so you got to be there for um, five full weeks. Yeah, I mean that's so cool. You got to be there for five full weeks. How, how much of the five weeks were you on set? I'd say about three of those weeks. Oh, so you were still there a decent ba- a bit there. I was, yeah, I was yeah. still there. And they they had built an entire town in the desert for this production. We had these unbelievable, authentic Dutch costumes, and we all had to speak in these crazy Dutch accent. The extras were incredible. I mean, I don't know where they found these people, but I looked at some of these people. I said, my God, they look like the real thing, you know? So there was just an authenticity to the to the entire production. I mean, they really put a lot of money into it. So just just being on set was an amazing experience. Yeah, that's so cool. Who's the director, Kyle? Sorry, who's who's the who's the director or producer of this show? The director was a guy named Craig McNeil. Hmm. Done a lot of a lot of movies. Yeah. He did a movie called Lizzie about Lizzie Borden. Yeah, several other great films. One called The Boy. Terrific director, very very subtle style. The producers was Lena Waith and Little Marvin. Yeah, Little Marvin, right? Okay, cool. Did you see them on set? Were they there? No, no, no. They they didn't come on set. I I believe they were probably more active uh, in the uh, California sh- uh, part of the shoot. Okay. Yeah, but it was it was an amazing, really an amazing experience. I mean, despite the dark nature of of what we all had to go through. Everybody just supported each other and got along. It was just a fun set to be on. It was just a, such a beautiful place. And you really felt you were living in another century. So the feeling of being transported, it was just uh, amazing, just just being there. You know, Gene, you and Kyle have a similarity um, besides being in horrific accidents. <laughs> you guys have done a lot of TV type of uh, police drama shows. Kyle, what are some of the ones that you have been on? Oh boy, you're te- you're testing my uh, my memory here. Pull up your IMDb page. Well, I do know. I think uh, Gene, you were on Law and Order. I think you were on all three versions of the Law and Order. I was only on SVU. Oh, so you must have lived in New York for a while. Yeah, that's where I started. I I well, I'm from upstate New York, and then after college, I moved to the city. I was there for a few years, and then it was like back in 2000. 10 is when I moved to LA, but right in that turn of like 2009, 2010 was right when, I, I don't know if it was like a tax thing that disappeared or what was going on, but all the law and orders except for SVU were canceled and they had like all the soap operas were leaving. So there's like, there's so much stuff that was leaving. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, you know, it's crazy again, but, but yeah, I was in New York for a little bit. Yeah. I think, I think it was a tax thing. I mean, that States kind of do that. They give that, that tax break and then, and, and then after a while they cancel it and they, flee to another state. 
you're in Atlanta, so that's another hot spot that gave the tax breaks, and and a lot of actors moved there because that was an, a new opportunity. Oh, yeah, yeah. And now New Mexico, and now New Mexico was that place. Yeah, I actually went out to um, Netflix Studios a couple times there in Albuquerque just to check that out. And yeah, it's like you know they have the Netflix Studio there, and then next to it they're building this entire community. I don't know if it's like going to be hundreds and hundreds of homes. And I think the idea is, I don't know if Netflix owns the community as well, or if it's you know someone else or a developer, but I think they're just trying to get a lot of the creative people there yeah. um, in particular and having housing. Well, that's for them great. Netflix that's great. But th- there's, there's one caveat for actors, uh, like in Atlanta, you can still live out of state and have an Atlanta agent and still work there. Sure. In New Mexico, you can't do that. You cannot work there. An agent will not take you on unless you're actually living there. Yeah, yeah, that's actually it's actually smart, and I think it's um, I think that also comes from some of the, like the contractual agreements and stuff to have to yeah, have to hire local, like, yeah. certain talent. Yeah, yeah, the local community. Yeah, it makes sense. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, you you would ask me about the law. Yeah, I was on a lot of the law and orders. A lot of the law and orders. Yeah. Your Raymond Hobbs one. Talk about that because that's the one that's probably was Emmy nominated. Oh, yeah, yeah. Movie. That was uh, – that episode of Law & Order is probably being played somewhere in the world all the time. I am still getting residual – I mean from other ones too, but I'm getting so many residuals from that one. It's it's one of the all-time popular Law & Orders. They want to kill me. No. They don't want anybody getting hurt, including you. No, no, no. They they think that I killed those girls. I don't know what they think. If they didn't, why else would they come looking for me? Sometimes police make mistakes. It's always a possibility. I was the guest lead on the show, and I kidnapped a woman in a pharmacy, and I asked for a lawyer. So a lawyer came in, but it was actually the opposing lawyer. that was played by Elizabeth Rome. I inadvertently confessed to her. And then there, there was a, a big court case uh, about could they use my confession in court because I was tricked, but I was tricked because a woman's life was in danger. I mean, they've got all this really interesting uh, stuff, which was great about the show. I got to work with Sam Waterston in that too. And uh, that was that was a great, a great experience. Uh, yeah, great experience. And, and the show And the show got nominated, yeah. Of all your work, that's probably my favorite. I mean, look, you're in, you're in my film. I mean, look, full disclosure, Gene was in my film, Blessed. I made an indie film, and Gene was uh, did a great job in that. He played he played Edward Duncliffe and kind of a a bad husband, right? And it and there's actually a scene with me and Gene in it where he's like, "There's no, they didn't give us any lines, even though I'm the writer. There's no lines. <laughs> I didn't give myself any lines." But Gene, there's a scene with me and Gene, and Gene's kind of like, "I'm a detective," and he's like, "His daughter, you know, the baby's been kidnapped," and he's like, just frothing spit coming out of his mouth angry at me in that one little kind of cutaway that was your direction bob that was your direction <laughs> it was funny the director rob fitz said he wished you would have slapped the notebook out of my hand just for <laughs> <laughs> oh i i, I would have loved so, to bob i would have loved so to. we're gonna get the paranormal in a, in a little bit you know but just on the set of blessed the main four actors Kyle, i don't know if they ever did this on any of your shows but they played like a little prank at the very end. So Gene, you want to share kind of, there was like, uh, there's a scene where Gene is, he leaves town. He tells her he's going to leave town for work. He's got a pregnant wife who's suicidal and just not doing well. Wow. Uh, the whole premise of Blessed is a woman who's pregnant and has this really big guilt from a childhood thing with her sister, entrapped in a horrible marriage and a stalker ex-boyfriend, everything's going wrong. And this guy moves in next door and he turns out to be, a uh, 2,000 plus year old guy. So the whole hmm. premise of the story, once it's revealed, is here's a woman who can barely survive day to day who meets a man who's lived forever. What can she learn from him, right? Hmm. So there's a scene where, you know, Gene's the bad husband and uh, he is in this. Now, Bob, Bob, I, I, have to, I have to pipe in there. I didn't think I was a bad husband. <laughs> I, you know. Well, compared to uh, Luther Elder, <laughs> yeah, you're actually like a saint compared to that yeah. guy. Yes, compared to Luther Elder, he was a saint. But, you know, he was also frustrated, the character. You know, the, my wife wasn't very nice to me. You know what? You brought that up. You defended the, I remember that. You defended I remember on set we talked about I that. Tried, I tried everything to get her in a yeah. good mood. And, you know, you, you try living with someone in a crappy mood all the time. <laughs> 
and you know, after a while, you're you're not going to be happy yourself, and, and you know, you find yourself. It's a two way. It's a two way street. It's and a two way street. With a hooker in a little hotel room, which is kind of a good segue <laughs> to the. Uh... Oh well, let's play. Let, okay. So, uh, Kyle, yeah. you have to watch it again, see if you agree with his take. But so, Gene, tell us, so, like at the end, when you do, when you wrap your final scene, you're in this small kind of little, not even a hotel room. It's like a little cabin, right? And you're with this kind of hooker. Yeah, well, you know, it's supposed to be a pretty crappy motel, Bob. You could have you could have put me up at like a, a Hilton or something, you know. That's all I could afford. <laughs> yeah. But uh all right. So yeah, basically I you know, my, my character's supposed to go on a business trip, which which I believe he did. He just took a little side side thing and um he uh, calls a prostitute. Again, Bob wrote it. I didn't write it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Calls a prostitute, so there. Oh, and Bob also wanted me to do a little magic for the prostitute. I'm I'm a magician. The character's name was Candy, and so I was supposed to pull out a little piece of candy from her ear when she comes in to try to be cute, you know. So there I am. I'm in the room. The shots on me, uh, and I'm all excited. I'm waiting for this prostitute to arrive, and the door knocks, and I'm here. And uh, I eagerly open the door, you know, waiting to feast my eyes on this beautiful prostitute. And um, what they had done was basically put a, a, a blonde wig on probably the uh, one of the more fleshy, masculine dudes there. <laughs> and, and, yeah, his and, name's Kurt Bergeron. He okay. was, yeah, he was. Uh, <laughs> and, and he's related to Tom Bergeron, by the way, <laughs> Kyle. <But> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he he pretty much had grotesque makeup on as well just to really you know make it make a whole thing of it and i was not expecting that and you know i uh, had a had a pretty interesting reaction which was caught on camera which i still haven't seen you haven't seen that i, I have to check for the I, outtakes on that i, I have, have not <laughs> seen my <laughs> reaction to rod bergeron coming in as a prostitute so all right I, i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to fish that up for you i so. want to okay, yeah. i want to see that Hi, I'm Candy. I'll bet you are. Oh. All right. Well, reset, that, reset, reset, reset. Okay. Candy, let me know when you're ready. Candy. Hi, I'm Candy. I'll bet you are. Can you tell me? Yeah. Can you tell me? So Kyle, did that ever happen in any of your productions where you're rapping and they play this kind of joke gag on you at the end of your thing? They do something, they kind of surprise you? Not that I can remember. Uh, you may want to do that with your films coming up because I know you're directing and doing horror stuff. But yeah, we did that with our top four actors. Uh, professional, professional directors don't do that. <laughs> we had to add some some spice into it. So, <laughs> I'm kidding. So I'm yeah, kidding. great great job though, Gene. And and look, this is a paranormal podcast, and it's, but a lot of great stuff. You have actually a couple. You had a very an interesting uh, paranormal experience, Gene, that you wanted to share with us. So when you were in New York, you want to want to give us that story. Sure. You know, it's a pretty long story. So if so, if I start to run out of steam at any point, you know, just just pipe right in and help me out. OK, sure. because uh, it's there's so much to it. I did write a little something just I'm, I might just read something that I, that I wrote just to sort of um, preempt it a little bit. When you talk about paranormal experiences, just just sort of in ge- general, uh, my thought of them is is that. I personally believe that there are lots of planes of existence. Even even the physicists have have theorized that there are many dimensions that our our physical eyes and ears can't see. Much like you you would have shown a a TV show to someone a few hundred years ago. To them, it'll be a window into some miraculous place just because they're not used to it. I think these are there are realities we don't understand, and we may have momentary breakthroughs, and uh, we call them paranormal. So, you 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 want to hear my experience? Yeah. So let me see where where do I begin? So 
I was living with this this girl at the time. Her name was Sarah Brecht. And Kyle, just F- FYI, I, have you heard of Bertolt Brecht? Oh, yeah, sure. This was his granddaughter. Oh, wow, cool. So I was I was living with Bertolt Brecht's granddaughter. Oh, cool. She was very, uh, the, the whole family didn't believe in God, didn't believe in the supernatural, didn't believe in any of that. It's just the human mind and logic. That's all that exists. Everything else, if you if you, you talk about anything paranormal or spiritual, you're you're weak. But uh, here I was, a guy who uh, meditated and had a guru, and uh, I was trying to get her in, in, involved in in that. I had found out about someone who did past life readings, and basically, you'd make a, a phone call to this person, and she would supposedly go into a trance. And then she would start to access something that I'm sure you heard of, the Ashkaic records. Akashic records, yeah. Akashic records, yeah, I don't even pronounce it right. Akashic records, mm-hmm. right. Yep, so yep. apparently this this past life reader, in, in going into a trance, um, it was able to do that. So I, she got on the phone. I guess it took like an hour. And um, when the phone call was finished, Sarah was... She was white. She was white like a sheet and visibly shaken, okay, which was very unusual because she's a very strong person and didn't believe in any of this stuff, right? This was completely hokey to her. So I had asked her what had happened, and she said, I I see in this lifetime you have a very strong attachment to your mother, okay? which was very true. I mean, they were checking in with each other like multiple times a day, which was bizarre. And um, she said, sometimes I see these patterns and these attachments to to people come from something, an emotional scar from lifetimes earlier. So she goes, let me look into an earlier lifetime. She goes, oh, I see your mother was, again, uh, very close to you. In this lifetime, she was your sister. In this lifetime, she was your best friend. In this lifetime, she was your mother again. So in in every single lifetime that this past life reader kept going back, she continuously saw that the, the woman who was her mother in this lifetime was always very, very close to her being extremely protective. Okay, you with me so far? Yeah. Yeah. This is great. Okay. Yeah. So she goes, let me let me see where the originating lifetime of this uh this attachment began. And she says, I see a lifetime many, many, many centuries ago where you are a nun and you are in uh a I don't know what you would call it. I'm I'm Jewish, but you know, it's a, a monastery or a nunnery or or something like that, right? Where convent, yeah. A convent. Exactly. Convent, right? Convent where all the nuns lived together and you were one of the younger nuns there. And the woman who was your mother in this lifetime was the mother superior, the, the head, the head honcho nun. Okay. She said, I see a very important male priest, a priest or a cardinal or, or someone very, very high on the, on the echelon who would, would, constantly uh, frequent the nunnery. And ultimately, she said that this priest, not just a priest, but he was a very important figure in the priesthood, basically raped, raped you and made you pregnant. And uh, gradually over time, it started to become uh, evident that you were pregnant. The baby started to show and she continued to tell Sarah. She goes, um, "You went to the uh, to the, the the mother superior and told her what had happened, but there was basically absolutely nothing that that she could do. She could not accuse this priest of raping her. Her hands were tied. There was nothing she could do. And as it became evident that uh, she said to Sarah, as it became evident that you were pregnant." There was a big scandal, and you were thrown out of the convent. Okay, hmm. you were basically thrown out onto the streets. You guys are with me so far. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay, because you were you were thrown out onto the streets, and every day this mother superior would 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 pass you and and watch you 
deteriorate and basically starve to death on the street. And she was torn. She was uh, destroyed because she knew what had happened. And yet there was absolutely nothing she could do to protect you. And then I believe that ultimately she died. Sarah died. And this woman who played the mother, who, who I guess played in the ultimate sense, you know, uh, we're all actors in the world as a stage, but the, the woman, you know, the, the mother, this incident had so impacted her. And you have to understand, it's my belief, and I, I don't know how you guys feel, I assume the same, but that a soul keeps being reborn lifetime after lifetime. And these attachments, these scars that we have, pull us into orbit with other people that we have these intense relationships with, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. So this this woman who was the soul who was her mother, it was so deeply embedded, this hurt, this helplessness to protect her was so embedded in her soul at the end that when she was reborn, she was constantly reborn in an orbit where she was trying to protect you, that the need to protect you, to protect Sarah, was so strong in her, was so dominant in her, that she was constantly being born lifetime after lifetime, either as her mother or her best friend or her sister, or, you know, put in that orbit where she could protect her. And this happened lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And that's where the mother's attachment to Sarah, to her, originated. So I said, well, that's a very interesting and amazing story, but you don't believe in any of this stuff, <laughs> right? Hmm. So Sarah says, yes, but when I lived when I, when I lived with Sarah at the time, um, the whole family was very much involved in the avant-garde theater of the East Village. And her mother, uh, Mary Brecht, who has since passed on, she was a costume designer, a, a very big costume designer, very talented woman uh, for a lot of... Uh, plays in the East Village, for like Sam, early Sam Shepard plays and Robert Wilson and really important figures in that world. Hmm. And um, she was doing a play about, uh, a play was being done about nuns. And so the mother said to Sarah, she goes, you know, one of, one of the uh, actresses in our show is about your size. And I'm trying to make sure the costume will fit. So this is a nun's habit. Will you please put it on just to see if it fits? And at the same time, Mary, the mother, had also a nun's outfit on. So Sarah came out and they basically faced each other wearing two nun's outfits. And Sarah said that she had this deep, deep, I don't know how she described it, this this Epiphany. epiphany, memory, disturbing feeling and she said and quickly they 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 had to take the nuns outfits off mm. so um i don't know it just even though maybe sarah didn't believe in this stuff at the moment she it shook her up it shook her up and it made a lot of sense to her anyway i i thought it was an amazing story i i thought even furthermore it really illustrates how i think past lives work to to my understanding that something happens to you emotionally really really powerful and it gets stuck in you not in your your physical body well i'm sure maybe it has a physical expression you, you know somehow but it but it remains in your energy body in your subtle body the body that 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 continues to live on after your body dies and then you're born into a new body and this this memory this deep embedded memory is is in you and it it basically impacts all your relationships how you see life your fears everything but it's subconscious so you may not know why you're so attached to your mother you may not know why you're scared of ropes you may not know why you're scared of water you may not know why you have an adversity to people with red hair but it's you know it could be that these these scars live on in us uh, from lifetime after lifetime and and we don't even realize where they they come from and then maybe if you're lucky you have a breakthrough moment like Sarah had and you come to an understanding of of why 
a relationship is the way it is. And I think it really illustrates the mechanics of, of the way this stuff works. Yeah, you know, what's kind of interesting, uh, Gene, is Kyle has a similar, not a similar thing, but he has this thing with Salem. You want to give uh, Gene the Reader's Digest version? Because you kind of go through something. You have this, you grew up in Odeonta, New York, I think, if I have the right town. Mm-hmm. You went to Salem one time as a kid, Kyle, but you felt this weird connection. You've talked to psychics and you keep being drawn back there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like... um it sounds like similar to like what Sarah experienced was, yeah, I don't know what it is. And it's, it's actually, I don't really have, I don't know the words. I don't know the accurate description to other than to say, like, there's just something when I'm present in Salem, that there's a feeling inside of me that I don't feel anywhere else. I always attribute it to like um, the feeling of when I was growing up and feeling like, when I look back upon my childhood and feeling like this comfort of, of being home and whatever that is and whatever that feels like. So now it's like, whenever I'm in Salem, that's just how I feel. I feel like I'm where I should be. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange, it's a strange feeling, but I, I, I'm interested, Gene, um, what is this? How did you come to your perspective of, you know, reincarnation and, and your beliefs and oh. like, how did that, is that something you've, thought for a long time or what what changed for you sure yeah yeah um oh uh, but b- before I, I answer that it, this is kind of interesting remember i know for the audience members who don't know what you look like i said earlier that you resemble daniel day lewis a lot <laughs> yeah. it's, it's i don't know if you've ever seen the crucible yes yeah sure i have that's Daniel Day Lewis in Salem. that's really funny yeah <laughs> sure <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got to tell you, so I'm going to throw it out since Kyle, you didn't say it really quick. He talked to a couple of psychics and they, they felt he was connected to the witch trials. It's even in the documentary I did where there's a noose, but it's empty. And so they didn't know, did Kyle, did he escape? Was he sticking up for the witches and did he, was he hung or did he escape or whatever? Or is it, or was the empty noose a witch saw that was uh, symbolic of him trying to, uh, I don't know, uh, it was it symbolic of him trying to leave that type of past behind. I don't know. Yeah, there was, there was, there was, I mean, I think there's been, uh, there's been at least two, if not three individual psychics and mediums that have mentioned me and some sort of connection to, to Salem's past. And, um, you know, they, they all kind of fill in different details, but yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. So you should, you should go back and watch that movie with that understanding. Maybe it'll. Yeah, that's a good idea, actually, for sure. You know, cause, I, cause that's, that's like you, man. Hey, I think that's like how we started today was, you know, you that's, know. that's something like, uh, you know, I think everything happens for a reason. Maybe, maybe there's something exactly. there. Yeah, exactly. So you asked me earlier, how did I, how did I come to this understanding? I mean, it, it was gradual. I've always had a, had a feeling of, of that there was more to existence than the material reality. I think when a soul is evolved enough not that I'm that evolved, but you know everything is relative. But I think when a soul reaches a certain point of its evolution, of its time throughout, basically going from a slug to an amoeba to a fish to <laughs> you know to a mammal to a, a human to like a lower, you know what I mean? Just uh, yeah, I believe o- over millennia, a soul gradually and gradually uh, evolves, and at a certain point, when I, I guess your soul is is ready you'll start to be awakened to some degree. You'll start to sense that there's more, there's more to this reality than meets the eye. And then any number of things can happen to begin that awakening. One of the, the, the ways that sort of really showed it to me was, uh, was LSD. Okay. And that is what we call a cliffhanger, ladies and gentlemen. We end episode one here and pick it up again in episode two, coming at you in about a week, where Gene will go into the LSD story and into his trip to India and his exploration and journey of mysticism. been listening to the afraid of nothing podcast please subscribe and like us on facebook until next time stay scared hey you're still here great then why not listen to another episode 
Visit afraidofnothingpodcast.com to peruse all the shows. That's afraidofnothingpodcast.com. And while you're there, click the coffee cup icon to buy me a coffee and leave a review. I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming episode. And the world will know how swell you are.